Let's bring in Reginald Walker, our mystic from the south. Walker, how are you? I'm well, Steve. Is unless college football expands the playoff, is, is there any? Now you're in the south, but is there getting to be some fatigue about an Alabama Georgia? I know it's only the second time, but Georgia's been in the thick of this thing for a while. That's Alabama Georgia, and the sports becoming in terms of interest like NASCAR. Uh, I, I think there is a chance for that, right? And I think the issue is, right, the last time we saw these two teams play, it got ugly. And Bama looked more than a step above what Georgia is. Now, everybody will tell you, well, that wasn't best, Georgia's best game, obviously. Okay, that may be fair. But if we see that again, then I think there's some fear. Now, the scariest part of this whole thing, though, Steve, is – I think what we're finding out over the last, since really the college football playoff era started, is there's really usually only one or two teams that are that good. And then the Mm -hmm. drop-off after that is stark. See, that's why I take a different approach on the playoff idea for this reason. Yes, if you get five versus 12 and six versus 11, or it's one versus 16, you'll get a couple of blowouts. But there's also the possibility that when seven plays eight and when six plays nine, you may actually end up with some really good games. <laughs> and that and that then would be, I think, the reward for expanding the playoff, even though it wouldn't be a semifinal game or, or a quarterfinal game. It would be something, it would be a, it would be different than some of it. You actually might end up with some, some good games that doesn't involve one or two. Correct. Correct. So, I think, and I think that's important, but I think where the problem lies is, right, because I, I'm with you on that, and I, I think that's an interesting aspect, an interesting way to look at it, and I think those will give us some quality games. The problem is we are such a society that is – Let's look at the end. Let's look at the end. Folks will lose sight of that by the time they get to the semis if they're one-sided. But I agree. I think if you do expand, that opportunity opens up for some really – and you know what's going to happen with that being said, Steve, the the, the seven, eight, and the six. Chances are you're going to get a group of five school. You know, that's Mm -hmm. where all of a sudden you get a BYU, and they're able to take down an Ole Miss per, per, per se, right? For, for instance, yeah. and so I think that's where it, it gets really interesting because people go, see, the uh, group of five schools can hang or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, But the reality is, right, when you get down to the four, what do those games look like? And I, I think that's where the issue is. But to your point, from a fatigue standpoint, I think that'll save some of the fatigue. But if it gets to the end and it be, continues to be one-sided, regardless of who's there, right, because one of the semifinals this year – Saw a Big Ten team, right, a Power Five conference team, yeah. uh, get get blown out by Georgia. So, in yeah. the same token, that's the ever-present question. And, and, and the one thing someone said to me is, uh, one guy said, well, I told you the group of five didn't belong. Cincinnati got blown out. And I said, well, okay, I'll give you that, but I'll give you two things on the back end. Michigan got blown out by Georgia, but in turn, Georgia got blown out by Alabama in the SEC championship game. So what does that really mean, right? At the end of the day, I think you, part of it is sometimes, right, as, as the guy on, on Twitter, Mr. Go, would say, uh, the moment got too big. And sometimes the moment gets too big for some talented football teams uh, versus other teams like Alabama who have been there, right? And so the moment will not be too big. Uh, let's experiment. Have a little fun with another aspect of it. Sometimes you can win a game like that in an opening round, and you're going to play the very next week instead of waiting three weeks. It might carry over for you in the next game. You might actually get better games in the next round because each team is in the rhythm of playing. Well, see, Steve, I think that's the biggest issue. I, I think the biggest issue with the college football playoff semifinals is we sit around for a month and wait. And I just, I don't think that works, which is why I think an 18 playoff makes sense. You, what I would do, the way I would handle it is 
I would, again, like, let's use this year for an example, this calendar. And I think I've said this on your show before. December 18th, I would have played the, the, the quarterfinals, if you will. One, yep. eight, two, seven, three, six, uh, four, five. Mm-hmm. That would have been two weeks from conference championship. So you give them a week off, get through awards mm-hmm. time and all that stuff. And then I'd start the bowls right after that. And yeah. all the other bowls, I want them all played up until New Year's Eve. Get them all out of the way. Okay, the Rose Bowl is going to stay on New Year's Day. It's fine. We'll see you on ABC between the semis. Fine. Whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And then on, on New Year's Day, you play the two semis. Right. And then you, and you're, so you're back on the same schedule that you're on right now. And then you get nine days later, whatever it is. Yeah. They play the national yeah. championship game. I think if you do it that way, not only do you not diminish the bowls, right? Because there's, there's a, essentially a two week window where you get all those bowls in. The other seven or 27 or 32 bowls, whatever it is, you get those packed into two weeks. That creates a lot of eyeballs, right? For people to watch and good football in there that people will care about. Then you get back to the semifinals on New Year's Day and the Rose Bowl. Again, they're going to do what they do. So mm-hmm. from that standpoint, you know, you're, you're in a spot to where you can keep the same calendar, which I think is important. Right. And, and the calendar is certainly, that's part of it. I mean, but it's also a time of the year where, as you know, people aren't in class. Uh Ivan Mizell wrote an article that there'll be a point in the college football playoff and his opinion down the road where somebody will opt out. Do you envision that as well? I, that's tough for me to see. Unless they go to go more than eight. I think if you're yeah. at eight, if you're going to see it, it's, it might be from the team that's sitting there at eight. I think if you go to 12, like they've talked about, I think it's hard to see some of those teams sitting down there at the 11 seed, 12 seed. You may lose some guys, right? Um, I think if you're at eight, where you're only talking about essentially, uh, right, There's it's, it's obviously three more games, but when you get to four and five more games, right, if you're going to 12 for, some, for certain seeds, the lower seeds, I think you're asking a lot to think that they're not going to opt out because some of those guys are going to feel like we, this is a gauntlet that we're just not talented enough to win and or this is a gauntlet I'm just not going to put my body through. I think two or three more games, if you go to eight, um, I think it's not as big a deal. So I, I think the more teams you have, the more chance you'll have for guys to opt out. Um, and, and so I think that's kind of a misnomer that people say, well, if you put more teams in the playoff, less guys will opt out. I disagree with that. Yeah, I, I think Ivan Mazel's right. There's going to be somebody at some point that's going to opt out of a playoff game. Uh, it, oh, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's, it's so personal uh, for players to say, okay, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to put my body out there one time, two times more, whatever, because they see millions of dollars as a possibility moving forward. Um, I, the I, transfer. I think, I think- I think there's a guy in college football right now. I, I don't know him personally, so I don't, I don't want to use him by name, but I think we both know who it is. He's a Heisman Trophy winner who's got a chance to win a national championship this year. I, it would, it would, I'll put it this way. If all of a sudden that young man has been told, you are the number one pick as long as you don't get hurt, there is no chance in my mind that he wouldn't at least consider saying, you know what? And y'all got another five star back there to play quarterback behind me. He's played a lot of garbage time this year. Go ahead and run him out there and get ready for next year too. And I'm gonna stay healthy. I, I just I, that that conversation, I think, may happen with that with a player of that ilk, with that kind of potential, that kind of um, expectation, right, of being the number one pick. Um, I think that family will have a different conversation than, say, for example, let's use Kenny Pickett as the example this year. Kenny Pickett is not going to be the number one overall pick. Chances are there's a quarterback that may not come off the board in the top ten. Right. Right. So with that being said, that's a different conversation. But if it's a quarterback, potentially the number one pick, I think that might be the candidate, as you mentioned, Steve, that opts out of a college football playoff game. Well, let's take it one step further. Uh, I'll make this the final question because I know we're going to get short on time. Jamar Chase 
sat out last year, is having a phenomenal season. Micah Parsons sat out last season. He is having a phenomenal season. I said a year ago that guys like that would set the tone for how the NFL looks at guys that opt out, that if they performed well, they wouldn't think twice about it anymore. Well, they're performing well. Is the door open because of what Chase and Parsons have done and how they've excelled in the next level that you were seeing people opting out of their third year? Yes, I think I think we will start to see that more and more. And 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 here's the reality. And I I don't want to I don't want this to come off in the wrong way, but unless the NFL sort of, if for lack of a better term, docks them in some way, right? If they lose some cachet because of that, yeah. then they won't do it. But I think to your point with Jamar Chase playing the way he is and Michael, listen, we may have the offensive and defensive rookie of the year in the National Football League as the two guys that sat out last year. Yep. If that happens, I think all of a sudden the narrative changes, right? I can sit out that year. Um, I can still be with my college teammates or I can go train somewhere, Arizona, Florida, whatever. We know there's all those uh, options out there. Um, if those guys do that, if they choose to do that, um, it puts them in a spot, right, to where the other thing the NFL is looking at is, well, his body is fresh. There's no injuries. He's not beat mm-hmm. up. As soon as we draft him, he's ready for many ca- – all these things um, that, that are going to be factors in that. So I, I think – and I said that before the draft as well. If guys mm-hmm. pan out that sat out, um, I think you're going to see more of them because the other thing is – With social media, and I think this is the thing that people aren't thinking about with this NIL thing, and I'm going to tie these two together here in a tight way here. With NIL, the value is no longer in the games played in college. It's in the social media following before you get there. So if you're a highly rated recruit when you get there, you already have the cachet that says you're going to be pretty good. So now you only need one really good college season or two really good college or two average college seasons for the NFL people to go, well, we think he's going to project differently here and they won't worry about it as much. So that's the other thing that I think we need to pay attention to is as this NIL thing continues, how much value are they getting out of their experience on the field? Because I would argue back when I played, when we didn't have social media, yeah, it was great that you were a high level recruit, but no NFL people had seen you. So until you get on a college field, and show them two or three years' worth of tape as a good player after redshirting or not, or four years, in a lot of cases, they didn't think you were good enough. Well, now they'll take one year because we'll get the narrative about, well, his body's not as beat up, so they'll take less time of you playing and then project you more, which is also why we're seeing the NFL in some ways get a little bit like the NBA, and a lot of GMs are getting fired because they're projecting and they're guessing, and they're guessing wrong. My friend, absolute pleasure. Thanks so much. Happy New Year. Look forward to many more conversations in 22. Absolutely. Anytime, Steve. And uh, safe travels, man. I know you got to move around with the basketball team. Safe travels. Be careful out there. Yeah. (laughs) We will, my friend. Thank you. Be well.